This video is made possible by the support of our fantastic patrons. Thank you so much for your continued generosity. We will prove your guilt. We don't arrest the innocent, you know. Welcome back to Affinity 4 Commander and our newest entry into the Best in the Multiverse series. Today we're looking at justice, righteousness, law and order and all things blue and white. As always, these lists are dictated by my own personal list of criteria and no partner commanders. Now, let's get on with our list. Number 5 You know what are overrated? Creature spells. I see you there, with your power and toughness, thinking you're all that in a bag of potato chips. Well, here's Noyan Dar to say no more. We can kill our opponents with lands now. Noyan Dar Royal Shaper is a 4-4 merfolk ally for 3 generic, 1 blue, and 1 white. He reads, whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, you may put 3 plus 1 plus 1 counters on target land you control. If you do, that land becomes a 0-0 elemental creature with haste that's still a land. Noyan Dar can confidently wear the mantle of land tribal death. Now, it might sound super risky to make your own lands very destroyable creatures, and it is. But what if instead we made indestructible land creatures? Darksteel Citadel and Cascading Cataracts are really good for making 3-3 three, three indestructible creatures. And if we're worrying about board wipes, don't! We're running a load of them ourselves, because so many say non-land permanents. Planar Cleansing, Hour of Revelation, and Urza's Ruinous Blast see this merfolk decimating our opponent's boards, and then being completely free to swing in with an army of 3-3 three, three lands. That's not even mentioning some of the ridiculous support this deck has. Terror Eternal to give all our newly created creatures indestructible, Sacred Grounds to make any removal pretty much pointless by returning killed lands straight to the battlefield, or even one of the single most specific counterspells I've ever seen, Teferi's Response, providing not only protection, but also drawing us two cards. And don't forget every single time we're casting a counterspell or draw spell, Noyandar is turning more and more of our lands into beaters. And honestly, who hasn't wanted to kill their opponents by throwing an island at them? A bit excessive, but definitely fun. Number 4 Now everyone knows a few universal truths. Red is terrible blink commander, Urza still did nothing wrong, and aura spells are pretty much a guaranteed 2 for 1 when your opponent blows up the creature you've been Voltroning up. That is, unless our commander brings them all back on attack. Bruna, Light of Alabaster, is a 5-5 legendary creature angel with flying and vigilance for 3 generic, 1 blue, and 2 white. She reads, Whenever Bruna, Light of Alabaster, attacks or blocks, you may attach to it any number of auras on the battlefield, and you may put onto the battlefield attached to it any number of aura cards that could enchant it from your graveyard and or hand. So, ignoring the fact that you can steal your opponent's buffing auras if anyone decides to run a spicy bear umber or spirit mantle, well, actually, let's not ignore that. That's pretty sick. Eat that, Uril. But moving beyond that, Bruna's ability to not only let you cheat out auras from your hand, but also grab all auras from your graveyard on attack or block, can instantly turn a very pedestrian 5-5 flyer into a one-hit kill. Especially with auras like Battle Mastery for that one-hit finish, Sage's Reverie, and Ethereal Armor to make Bruna super swole. Or even, and imagine this, Attaching Eldrazi Conscription to Bruna from your hand because, and say it with me now, fair and balanced magic. Although to be fair, that's still not as bad as pulling Corrupted Conscience out of nowhere to kill with infect damage in Azorius. Yep, Bruna is definitely one brutal commander, but 
slightly only one trick to her in my mind. And it is definitely a good trick, don't get me wrong. But for the top three, I demand a little bit more versatility. Such as... Number three. Okay, this might show off my slight bias for flickering creatures for maximum value, but there is no Azorius commander better for doing this than Brago, King Eternal. Um, yeah, good luck with that eternal part. Brago is a 2-4 legendary creature spirit with flying. He reads, Whenever Brago, King Eternal, deals combat damage to a player, exile any number of target non-land permanents you control. Then, return those cards to the battlefield under their owner's control. Flickering Value Incoming Need to kill the king's enemies? Duplicate, Meteor Golem, Sunblast make all those worrisome problems disappear. Need more recursion value? Sun Titan Revelark Karmic Guide are here to grow your value engine. And what would a king be? without some noble knights. Nah, I'm just kidding, they're planeswalkers. Planeswalkers weak and flicker to use their abilities twice in the same turn. Elspeth, Sun's Champion, Tezzeret the Seeker, and even Venser for more flickering value goodness. Brago can even help by giving us more mana available to us each turn by flickering our mana rocks, letting us not only play our sorcery speed goodness, but then also keep mana up for a cheeky count spell or cyclonic rift. I didn't say he was a fair king after all. But Brago manages to get this high on the list because of that ability to flicker any non-land permanence, which can help evade cumulative upkeep costs on our Mystic Remora, or if the situation in the game has changed, and using that grasp of fate earlier in the game now seems like a bit of a waste, Brago can flicker our enchantment and have it come back to get rid of that Ulamog our opponent played on turn 6 after assuring the table it wasn't that type of deck. Because that's what our king needs. Options and versatility. But unfortunately he can't blink lands, so it doesn't ramp us super effectively, so he can stay at number 3. But speaking of ramp in Azorius, number 2. Grand Arbiter Augustine IV is a 2-3 legendary creature for 2 generic, 1 blue, and 1 white. He reads, White spells you cast cost 1 less to cast. Blue spells you cast cost 1 less to cast. And spells your opponents cast cost 1 more to cast. Oh, and Alex, he's also a human advisor. That is true. So if you want to make that advisor mill deck you've always dreamed of, I can't think of much better commanders for this than Augustine, but that's not really why he's here. He's here because the second he's put on the table to begin a game of commander, the rest of the table will groan so loudly it might actually crack Soren out of that wall. No, our former Grand Arbiter is here because he is, in my opinion, the absolute pinnacle of you're not going to play magic, I'm going to play magic in blue and white. Even just with himself, he's already taxing our opponents for every spell they cast whilst making ours cheaper. And if we happen to have a blue and white spell, it's too generic cheaper. We have Sphinx's Revelation for two additional cards in life, Ojitai's Command for only one white and one blue, or how about Narset Transcendent Master for only two mana as well? Unfair cost reductions like this while taxing our opponents already make Augustine exceptionally strong. But then we get to the rest of the meanness of this deck. Propaganda, Ghostly Prison, and Sphere of Safety to stop people from attacking you. Linvala, Keeper of Silence to stop artifact abilities. Authority of the Consoles to gain life and slow the game right down and even Mind Sensor to stop people searching up an answer to all this stacking nonsense. Honestly, I could go on, but I can't afford to pay the additional 17 mana for my next example. But I don't want my disappointed demeanor to come across like I loathe Augustine that much. He creates a soft lock, or, okay, sometimes a pretty hard lock on the game, and then can win through things like Approach of the Second Sun, Azor's Elocutors, or making a load of angels with Luminarch's Ascension. 
he is an exceedingly worthwhile commander. But not because he himself is a particularly big threat, he's just very efficient at preventing our opponents from being threats at all. Number 1 Oh how I ummed, oh how I ahed, about whether to give the number 1 spot to this card or Augustine the Fourth. But I can't in good conscience give the number 1 spot to a commander whose play strategy is to not let your opponents play altogether. No, for the number one spot, our commander at least needs to do something. That's why I'm giving my personal top spot for Azorius Commanders to Tygam, Ojutai Master. And yes, I am being serious. Tygam is a 3-4 legendary human monk for two generic, one white and one blue mana. He reads, Instant, sorcery and dragon spells you control can't be countered by spells or abilities. And... Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell from your hand, if Targam Ojutai Master attacked this turn, that spell gains rebound. Now you might not deserve this Targam, so don't let it go to your parallel universe betraying head, but 287 decks on EDH Rec is honestly way too small for this commander. And hopefully this will help shine even a little bit of light on him, especially when Guafar is more popular, Take your bribery counts and pillow fort and shove it, Guafar. We're here for dragons and value like you wouldn't believe. Targam not only hates on control super hard, his awesome ability to give spells rebound doesn't even require he deal combat damage, just that he attacked. But our monk is just one wisp of silk cloak or steel of the godhead away from being able to attack without worry. And then, boom rebounding all over the shop. Targam's ability isn't even the next spell you cast. It's not limited in any way. You can drop as many as you can, and they're all coming back. You want to take turns after turns after turns? Well, double casting, time warp, temporal manipulation, and your old buddy Nexus of Fate sees you taking so many extra turns that you may as well bring a coloring book to give to your opponents while you find out if you've won or not. Okay, maybe I spoke too soon on that whole wanting a commander to actually do something bit. But it's not just looping turns that Targam's good for. Any draw spells, dig through time, treasure crews, or even the solidly underrated charter course. Or what about double steel or clone effects? Who doesn't want to cast blatant thievery two turns in a row? Or bribery or clone legion? Win through sheer creature damage in Azorius, just imagine. And of course, all of this is uncounterable. You know what else is uncounterable in this deck? Dragons. Dragon Lord Ojitai gives us some great card advantage with being able to impulse every time they deal combat damage. Kaiga, the Tide Star, lets us steal even more of our opponent's creatures. And Steel Hellkite is well, Steel Hellkite, you just can't really go wrong there. Targam can honestly be one of the hardest spell slinging decks in these colours, with making sure everything you do, draw, steal or removal, all happens again in your next upkeep. He doesn't honestly see the play he should, and when people are scared to death of a 3-4 with no combat abilities hitting them, how on earth does that not make for a fantastic commander? He's just good. In fact, he's better than good. He's great. Two uncounterable rebounding thumbs up to you, Targam. My top pick for best Azorius commander. And that is our list. But what do you think? What's your favorite Azorius commander? Do you think some sphinxes were stiffed out of a spot on the list? or any cards that really break our commanders. Whatever your thoughts, let us know in the comments below. If you like this type of content, let us know by liking this video and subscribing. You can also follow us on Twitter at 4Commander. And if you really like us, you could consider becoming a patron yourself. As always, we'll see you next time.